So as we look at this passage in Revelation chapter 9 verses 1 through 12, which is the fifth seal, uh, what we will see is we will see uh, through the fifth seal the release of Apollyon or Abaddon and his demonic army. And this is going to be a very significant event on the earth, obviously, during that time. Again, just a reminder uh, for us in Calvary Chapel, we believe strongly, firmly that we will not be here during this time. But the rest of the world who has not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ will be here during this time. And they will be suffering under these punishments primarily so that they would have a chance to repent. Because the Lord doesn't just punish just for the sake of hurting people. He punishes because, firstly, it's a just uh, thing to punish us for our sins. But secondly, because he wants us to repent, wants people to repent. Uh, and so the, the people on earth at this time are not repenting. So he needs to keep punishing them so that they would turn back to him. Better for them to be suffering temporarily and repent than to spend eternity in hell. And so God makes it very clear to them that they need to change their ways. And especially through this fifth seal, uh, this, sorry, this fifth uh, trumpet judgment. So here in verse 1 it says, uh, now the first part of this in verses 1 through 2, we see the opening of the bottomless pit. So let's look at that again. Verse 1 says, Then the, an the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Now we've seen a concept of a star falling from heaven to earth before. Uh, actually, the third trumpet judgment has also a star falling from heaven to earth. But back in that uh, teaching, uh, uh, probably almost a month ago, I noted that that's probably not a person. It's probably not an angel. It's probably some kind of a meteoroid or something like that uh, because when it fell, it broke up and it poisoned the rivers. I don't know what it was made of, but what, you know, it was called wormwood, which is something of a, a bitter poison. And it uh, poisoned a third of the rivers of the earth. Now I said that star was not a person. Uh, what about this star here? Is this a type of a person or some other kind of a being or is this a non-person a non thing? What do you guys think? It's a so you say at the karm, you say a being, person, an angel, uh, an, uh, an angel or a demon. Now, uh, it, initially when you see star falling from heaven, you think, oh, angel, right? Because, you know, usually angels are all, you think of angels bright and nice and shiny. Uh, but uh, demons really aren't any different than angels. Uh, if you uh, look and see what the Bible says about demons, they are just sinful angels. And so their nature doesn't look any different. It's not like when they uh, <laughs> when they fell into sin that they became all twisted and gnarly or something. No, they can make their appearance look just as beautiful as an angel. In fact, Paul warns us about that in Galatians, that if an angel comes to you preaching another gospel, that let it be accursed. You know, it's, it's not of God. So things could appear to us as angelic beings and still be of a demonic nature. Now this one, it says, I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So this star is from heaven and goes to earth. Now, uh, you might say, well, because it's from heaven, it could be an angel. However, we know that even in the Bible, it talks about the fact that Satan is allowed to go into the presence of God to kind of report in. At least we find that out in the book of Job. Uh, Job. <laughs> uh, Job. <laughs> I mixed up my uh, words there. Job, the book of Job, we see uh, Satan reporting in before God because even Satan is not outside of the sovereign authority of God. Uh, he is not allowed to just do whatever. Now, he does whatever he wants of his own desires, but he can't do anything that God doesn't allow him to do. And so could it be that this angel at this present time is coming down from heaven, he, but he's uh, of a demonic nature. Uh, now, not that they dwell with God in that sense, but uh, in the sense that they're in the, the, the realm of God, outside of this dimension. They're in God's dimension and not our dimension. Now, could it be that it's a demonic being? Well, we'll see later on that there will be a battle in heaven 
and Michael the Archangel will lead the angels. God isn't, doesn't even need to be involved. He's just like, Michael, you take care of that because Satan is so much lower. He's a created being. He just, God just tells Michael the Archangel to just go take care of that and kick out Satan. So we'll see that later on in the book of Revelation that there's a war in heaven and that uh, Satan is kicked out. And so could it be that this is actually a demonic being that goes down to release these also possibly demonic beings? It's possible. I don't know for sure, uh, but given the, 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 uh, the, the look of it, it almost feels like it's a demonic being. Actually, it kind of reminds me of what uh, Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, where after the disciples came back in Luke chapter 10, he says, I saw, a star, I saw uh, Satan fallen from heaven, and you have kind of like the descending kind of look. Now, uh, is it absolutely a, a demon or an angel? It, I don't think you could say either way. Uh, but it's somebody who's ultimately under the control of God, under the dominion of God, who is allowed under God's uh, sovereignty to release this plague of creatures or demonic beings onto the earth. And so he goes down and what is he given? What is this? So this, this being is given a key to the bottomless pit. Now, what... Where is the bottomless pit? It says, I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Where is the bottomless pit? What is the bottomless pit? <laughs> so here, from the context, it appears that this is the same thing that Peter talks about, where it talks about in chapter 2 of Second Peter, that the angels or demons are imprisoned. They're imprisoned in that uh, passage in chapter 2. It, it says it's a place called Tartarus, which is actually a, a Greek concept of a you know, spiritual prison. Uh, but using that concept to speak of a, a real place that is a demonic prison where demons are kept in chains until they are to be released at this time to do punishment upon the earth. So there are demons that are currently imprisoned somewhere. Now... I've heard people say before that there is, the center of the earth is this demonic prison. I don't believe that's so. I believe that it is in another dimension altogether. Now, it does say it comes down to from heaven to earth, uh, but maybe it is that the portal that is open from that dimension is here at the earth, that it's all open. Uh, but I don't think that if you dug down deep enough that you would get to a place where you could release you know, demonic beings or something like that. I don't think that that's the case. Uh, even though that's actually been, uh, there's been several Christian fiction books that talk about that kind of thing. It's kind of funny and, you know, kind of cool, like kind of crazy to think about, but I don't think it's a physical realm. These are not physical beings. These are angelic, demonic beings, not angelic, but demonic beings that are of another nature compared to us. So they wouldn't be bound by physical boundaries. Uh, so it is a spiritual prison. Wherever this spiritual prison is located, it's in another dimension, I believe. And so he's given a key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. Now, as this opening is as this, this door, I guess, is opened from what I would say is another dimension into this dimension here at the earth, all this smoke comes out of the bottomless pit and into the earth. Uh, and what's the effect of that at the end of verse 2? <laughs> it's okay. You want to come in? I don't know who that is. That's mine. Come in. <laughs> Join us. Join us. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> And so as this smoke comes out, what do we see? We see the sun and the air are darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And we've seen this uh, several times before where there's been the sun and the moon that are darkened by various cataclysmic events, maybe uh, earthquakes that dislodge material or maybe volcanoes even caused by the earthquakes that dislodge material into the atmosphere. In this instance, or maybe even fires as the, the grass and green grass has been burned up several times. And so maybe this is uh, some kind of a, but it's, uh, it's a burning from this other dimension and smoke comes out of it into our dimension, into the earth. 
And the effect of that is that the air is filled and uh, the sky is darkened so that we can't see. It's a very, uh, a very apocalyptic, you know, where it's just kind of crazy looking and you're, you kind of uh, see those things in those movies where the earth is about to be destroyed or something, uh, where it looks all darkened and everything like that. So this is the opening that we see. And now we're going to see this demonic army come out forth from this uh, prison, from this spiritual prison. So let's go ahead and read verses. Th uh, I'll go ahead and read verse three since we've already read it together. So verse three says, then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, this is a very interesting picture that we have. So we've got this prison that's opened up. We've got this bottomless pit that's opened up and out of it comes locusts. Now, uh, as you know by now, I've said it many times at Calvary Chapel, we interpret the Bible literally unless it can be shown that it's probably figurative. And so, you know, you really have to look at the context and see if it's talking about something that's literal. If it could be literal, then it definitely is literal. Or if it's a miraculous thing that God does, you can consider it literal. Uh, but sometimes there is going to be figurative things that you see, or John is going to say, this looks like this. And I think this is one of those instances. I don't think that this is actually an army of locusts like we see it, you know, grasshoppers. I think this is a demonic army that in its general form looks like grasshoppers uh, because they've got wings, but it's more like the kind of grasshoppers you see in Bugs Life. You guys ever seen the movie Bugs Life? Yes. My 90s kids, you know, <laughs> Bugs Life, right? Uh, with those grasshoppers and they kind of like have faces like men, right? That's what I think of. Not like a regular grasshopper that you would see, but like a, a, a demonic looking grasshopper. And we'll see later on, it, it's not like a regular grasshopper. They have faces like men. They've got hair like women, uh, long hair. And I've never seen a grasshopper with long hair. So uh, it's not really a grasshopper grasshopper, uh, but it is a flying thing. Uh, and, and you know, you, you think of the angels and the demons. The, the demons are just angels, right? So remember at chapter four, we saw the living creatures flying around the throne. And they were fantastic. I mean, just these amazing creatures with different faces and different features that are just otherworldly. So also with the demons, they have these crazy features and crazy looks if you'd see them for what they really are. And so we see here that this group of locusts, this army of locusts come out of the earth. And what's the power that's given to them? So in verses three through six, we'll see a description of the power and the authority of this locust army. So in verse three, what is the power that they are given? Last part of verse three, what power are they given? As scorpions of the earth have power. So they have a similar function. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see as they, as we go along, it's the, the power to hurt men and women, hurt mankind, but not to kill. And generally, uh, if you look at scorpions, uh, which I'm not sure, I don't think there's scorpions in the Philippines. Scorpions here in the Philippines? Rare lamb. In some of the forests? Okay. So, because I, I know like different places there, they have different types of scorpions. In Vegas, we have these big black scorpions. Have you seen that, Ed, out in the outskirts? Uh, we lived in this place that was kind of more in the desert. And uh, that was actually before we were coming to the Philippines in 2003. We stayed at somebody's house and it was kind of far out in the desert. And so one morning, go out in the garage and there's these two black scorp big black scorpions fighting with one another, you know, with their tail. And, you know, they've got their little pincher things. Almost looks like half crab, half, I don't know, you know, scorpions are so crazy looking, right? And so it's got eight legs. So I was looking it up. Apparently it's, it's in the same family as spiders, arachnids. And I'm like, wow, I never thought of spiders and scorpions at the same because they've got those big claws and then they got that big stinger on the back there. And if you get stung by a scorpion, which I've never been stung by a scorpion, but I read about it, and it's apparently very, very painful, but rarely is it deadly. Deadly, And they are given power as scorpions. They're not scorpions, but they're given power as scorpions. Although later on, we will see that they have a tail that they can harm people with. So kind of part locust, almost like a horse 
with women's hair, and later on we'll see they've got this tail that they hurt people with. And so they got power like a scorpion, meaning to say they can't kill people, but they can hurt people a lot. Looking at verse 4, we see part of the limits of their authority. What are they allowed to do? So in verse 4 it says, They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So here we see the limits of their authority. Now previously, we saw in a previous judgment that all of the green grass was burned up. So what's up? Why is there green grass here again? What's that? So there's, we don't know how much time is in between these different judgments. We know there is time because the, the tribulation period is seven years, but we don't know how much time. So obviously it's enough for the green grass to grow. But again, you know, how long does it take for grass to grow, right? I don't know. It's like maybe a week or something yeah. like that. So it's pretty fast. Uh, you could burn off the top layer of grass and there would still be seeds underneath that could grow back up. And so some of the grass has again, begin, uh, again been, been able to grow. And remember, the trees weren't completely consumed in the previous judgments, only partially consumed. So there's still trees, there's still green grass and, and green growing things. And so the, the earth has started to have some growth again from the previous burning judgments. And this judgment is not focused on anything natural, it, it, except for humanity. It's focused primarily on humanity. But who is spared from being struck by this plague? So the ones with the seals on their head, but who are the ones with seals on their heads? Remember back to chapter 7? The 144,000 were sealed, and they are of the, the tribes of Israel. Now, I assume, because it's not clearly stated, that if there are any Christians on earth at this time, that they would have already been killed by the Antichrist, if they got saved during this period. No, uh, it... Right now, we're having a very linear perspective, like this, 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 and this. But when we get to chapter 13, it'll take a view back and it'll say, this was something that was going on during this time period. And so it'll say, you know, what's, what happened with the beast and the, you know, the Antichrist and all this stuff. It'll take a view back to what was going on and saying this is happening at the same time. So we have these interluding visions, if you remember, and that happens again in chapter 13, looking back at this time. And what we find out from that is that during this time, if there is anybody who won't uh, take the mark of the beast, which if there's anybody who gets saved at this time, they won't take the mark of the beast, then that person cannot buy or sell food and or any kind of goods. And if they will not... Uh, bow down and worship the image of the beast, which who knows what that is, maybe some kind of AI robot, who knows, you know, who knows what that is, that, that it mimics the beast, right? Well, if they won't do that, then they will be beheaded. So if there is a Christian on earth that gets saved, they will be killed, and they won't even experience these judgments, they'll be killed. Probably in between the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. Uh, most likely. Again, it's not very clear, absolutely clear, but from what I've been able to determine through counting up all the different days and things, most likely between the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments is when the Antichrist is on earth and then he reveals himself at the middle and kills everyone who won't worship him and take his, uh, worship him or take his mark. And then after that, that's when you start getting these crazy judgments in the second half. And um, this is, again, one of those crazy judgments in the second half. And so who's left? The Jews. The Jews are still on earth. And the Jews, we know from the Old Testament especially, will be hidden. In fact, chapter 12, that will be clarified for us that the Jews will be taken out to a place in the desert and be protected from the Antichrist. And so also from this demonic army, it seems like. That's, again, another interluding vision we'll come back to. And so we see that this uh, judgment here that happens does not happen upon the Jewish people. That those who are sealed, that they will not be partakers of this judgment. Again, the 144,000 are only of the tribe of Israel, according to chapter 7. Now, in verse 5, it says, They were not given authority to kill them but to torment them for five months. So not given the authority to kill them, but the authority to torment them. 
and five months of complete terror. Now, you know, you think about uh, difficult situations, and I don't know if you guys have ever been through a very difficult, like, typhoon or storm. I know I haven't experienced one that, like, completely destroyed everything I have, uh, because Dumaguay, we don't generally have stuff, but uh, of course, we had that storm pass through Bindoy where a lot of people lost their homes and their uh, churches and things like that. And uh, right now, I'm thinking about it because in the US, there's this massive. A uh, storm that just went through Florida and just a whole bunch of devastation, right? Milton, yeah, Milton. And right a week ago was Helen, Helen, Helene. I don't know how they pronounce it. Uh, and so you know, you think about, and of course that happens. We're kind of used to that in the Philippines uh, because uh, it happens so frequently that typhoons hit us over here. Uh, but but also in Florida, it's quite frequent. And so, but you know, going through suffering. Usually it's a you know, short amount of time and then things get back to normal. But man, this is going to be five months of just constant pain as these demonic beings go around harming the peoples of the earth consistently, constantly. I mean, it's just going to be a time of weeping and wailing and well, as we speak later with another judgment, just probably gnashing of teeth as people blaspheme God and spew their hatred towards God and not repent of their sins. And uh, it's just going to be a time of, of terror on the earth, a time of torment. But they could turn to the Lord. They could repent of their sins, but they're going to choose not to. It says their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man, which again is very painful, but in, its, in terms of a scorpion, not generally deadly, uh, generally just very, very painful. Verse 6, in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Now, this is kind of interesting because, you know, you, you think about it. Why, why they say they want to die. Why can't they commit suicide? Not, and I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying they should. But, you know, somebody who's an unbeliever who has nothing to live for and wants to die. I mean, why does it say they won't be able to die? Now, that's kind of something I've heard a lot of speculation over the years uh, because some people, some people say that there's going to be medical advancements during this time that will allow people to be regenerative. And so if they lose an arm, the arm will grow back kind of like a, you know, how a crab grows back its claw, something like that. I, I've heard lots of theories about this. In fact, there's been uh, research with mice that they, they'll, they'll break the mice's back, you know, and then they'll uh, do some kind of, I don't know, something that they'll inject with the mice, some kind of genes, and the mice grows back its spine and is able to recover and heal itself. And it's kind of like crazy. I'm like, wow, this is interesting. I've even heard people say that the mark of the beast is actually the beast of uh, the Antichrist genetic code. Remember how, well, 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 we haven't gotten to it yet, but it's, it's going to be earlier on when the Antichrist is revealed at the beginning of the seven years, uh, that uh, the Antichrist will have a mortal wound, but that he will heal miraculously. And so there's been speculation that maybe he will give some of his genetic material, and that's part of the mark of the beast, that when he marks you, his genetic material is given to you so that you can't die. And that will be one of the things why people want to worship the beast because they'll have the promise of living forever. I don't know. It's not very clear on that. But for some reason, they won't be able to die. For, for some reason, they just won't be able to die. Maybe they'll try and do it. Maybe they'll be like Wolverine. You know, I haven't seen the latest movie because it's got way too much profanity and nastiness. So I don't want to see Wolverine versus whatever. Deadpool, Deadpool whatever, that, yeah, whatever that one is. I haven't watched that. Uh, but, you know, Wolverine, he can uh, shoot himself in the head and then the bullet pops out and he's like, okay, I'm back, you know. Uh, maybe it will be like that in the future. There will be some kind of a medical advancement where you just won't be able to die. I don't know exactly for sure, but for some reason, they won't be able to die. They will want to die and they won't be able to die uh, for some reason. But that's the power and authority of the Locust Army. They will be... They will have authority over all mankind except for those who are sealed, the 144,000 Jews that are sealed and that are worshiping God and serving God on the earth. They won't be able to uh, hurt them. But every other human that is on earth during that time, they will be able to hurt for five months but not be able to kill. And that will probably be part of the torment that they just won't be able to die. Now, in verses 7 through 10, we have a description of the appearance of the locust army, which is why I believe they're not actually locusts, because 
They have a very weird description. So let's continue in verse 7. Verse 7 it says, The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. So the shape. I've never seen a locust that looks like a horse. <laughs> so it's got wings, but it's, it's, not, it's not a grasshopper. You know, it looks more like a horse. So the shape of the locust was like a horse or like horses prepared for battle. And we'll see further what this means because they've got, uh, as, a, as a battle horse would be with armor and all kinds of fancy things, that's what they look like as well. So lo looking at the second half of verse 7, it says, On their heads were crowns, of, were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. Now, I think John knows what gold looks like. And so he's saying it's, it's not gold, it's something that looks like gold, so yellowish and shiny, but I don't know. I don't know what it is actually. John doesn't know. He says it looks like gold, so something goldish and shiny. Uh, maybe it's, you know, super gold. I don't, I don't know what it is, uh, but something that looks like gold. And then additionally, their faces were like the faces of men. So the, the crowns of on, their, on these locust creatures' heads are crowns, right? So they're all like kings of their own right. And then they've got faces like men. So this is a pretty fantastical picture. They're the shape of a horse with wings, crowns on the head, face of the horse is, face of the locust horse is a man. <laughs> this is... Uh, the, the weirdest thing I think I've ever, ever not seen, because I have never seen something like this. Verse 8, they had hair like women's hair, which I'm going to ima imagine means long hair, because generally men have shorter hair, uh, women have usually longer hair, so I'm going to guess that that means they have long flowing hair, which is not typical of either a horse. Uh, horses have a mane at the back, but not like women's hair that all comes from the head. Uh, and not, definitely not like locusts. Locusts don't have any hair at all. And so they've got their faces like a man. They've got long hair, shape of a horse, looks like a locust. Obviously, they can fly. In verse uh, 8, second half of verse 8, it says their teeth were like lion's teeth, which means probably mostly incisors, the, you know, the sharp teeth incisors where they can tear into flesh. So, you know, look all happy when they smile at you and they got those all the sharp, nasty teeth. Ooh, kind of creepy. You know? <laughs> Hope you don't have nightmares later on. <laughs> so they've got teeth like lion's teeth. Verse 9, they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, which generally, if you're, you know, the picture of a horse prepared for battle, uh, horses that would go into battle would have a, a, some kind of an armor, especially on the front, front armor and then maybe a little bit on the sides, not too much, but a little bit, and then especially on the front and on the head as well. So they've got breastplates of iron to protect them from, you know, weapons. And then we have a description of what they sound like. So the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. So you've got this just tremendous sound. Uh, if ever you've heard like a lot of wings flapping together, uh, if ever you've you know seen a big uh, swarm of locusts, I don't know. Have you guys ever seen a swarm of locusts or a swarm of like bees, maybe even? Ever, ever been attacked by a swarm of bees? Hopefully not. <laughs> Hope not. But if ever you've heard a big group of some kind of a, a creature like that, even small bees and locusts can make a big sound. What about creatures that are like the size of men with wings that big? What kind of a sound is that going to be like? It's going to be a massive sound. And, and so you've got this amazing, terrifying sound of these wings, like the sound of chariots with horses running into battle. So it sounds like a chariot army because the wings are so loud. In verse 10, Continues the description. It says they had tails like scorpions and there were stings in their tails. Stings, plural, in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. So they've got tails, which most scorpions, I mean, they, they have an abdomen, but they don't have like a tail. So this is different than a traditional scorpion, just like it's a horse with this long tail, like a scorpion. 
a locust horse scorpion. <laughs> it's crazy. So you've got this tail sticking out with stings, plural, in it. Now, I don't know uh, what John is describing there, but it's plural, stings, plural. I'm not sure if that's just referring to the fact that it can keep stinging you or if that's referring to the fact that there's multiple things that sting you, not like a traditional scorpion, which just has one stinger. Maybe this has multiple stingers coming out of its tail. But uh, whatever it is, it's very, very painful when it hits you. And so this, uh, these locust horse scorpions <laughs> that look like men with women's hair and terrifying teeth, they go around stinging mankind for five months. Uh, now, uh, I've seen, uh, you know, many people will say different things about this locust army. And, you know, who knows? Honestly, I don't know because it hasn't happened yet. But sometimes they'll say maybe this is Apache helicopters, you know? <laughs> I, I don't think so because Apache helicopters don't really look like horses. I mean, maybe. I don't know. Maybe not, not quite. And there's definitely no stinger, like tail stinger. Uh, unless it's a different new type of helicopter that has some kind of a thing. I, I don't know for sure. Uh, but they, they compare it to like Apache helicopters uh, or something like that. I don't see that. I honestly don't see that. Some other people have compared it to tanks with the, you know, the tank turret. And he thought it was the stinger at the back, but it's really the turret and it shoots out of the turret. I don't think that's the case either. I think it's a demonic army that looks like elements of the natural world. It looks a little bit like a locust. It looks a little bit like a horse. It looks a little bit like a scorpion, but it's a demonic army. It looks also a little bit like a human, but it's a demonic army. Uh, so I don't think it's something that mankind creates. I don't think it's a patchy helicopter or a tank or anything like that. I go more with the literal that it's some kind of a creature that looks all, like all these things, has all these characteristics, which really makes it even more terrifying if it's a literal creature that looks like this. I mean, this is something straight out of a horror film. I don't think, uh, who's that horror film creator guy? See, I don't think even, yes. I don't think even Stephen King could make a, a worse horror movie than this. I mean, this is literal just like horror on earth for five months. Now, again, does God want this to happen to humans? Does God want to do this to humanity? No, he doesn't. In fact, for thousands of years, he's given mankind the opportunity to repent and accept the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. He allowed his son to go down to this earth and suffer willingly on the cross to pay for all of our sins so that we wouldn't have to endure his wrath. Jesus Christ himself is the propitiation for our sins and not only for ours, but for the whole world. That's what 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says. And so God is given so much time, even if you, you know, if, even if it was to happen tomorrow, the rapture tomorrow and the uh, tribulation period tomorrow, God's given 2,000 years of grace and mercy to this earth. How much more time is he going to give? I don't know. Uh, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. There's a lot of crazy stuff happening in the Middle East. It could happen soon. But even if it happens tomorrow, God has given more than enough grace and mercy for the people of this world. And if he has to judge them, he is right in doing it. But let me ask you something. Why does he not allow them to die? Is he just a sadistic, capricious God in heaven who likes watching people suffer? <laughs> something, you know, with a crazy laugh like that. Is that what God is like? No. In fact, we know, again, I think I mentioned this before, but Ezekiel chapter 3 and also many chapters in Ezekiel, God does not desire the death of the wicked. He does not. Why is he doing this? And then why is he not allowing them to die? Because he wants them to repent of their sins. Unfortunately, at this time, they do not and they won't. Uh, many of them at least won't. Now in uh, verse 11, we see a description of the king of the locusts army. So it says, and they had a, as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. And so we've got this uh, king over the angels, over these, uh, over these demons, which again, remember, demons are angels. 
they are just sinners. The reason why they're called demons is because they're sinful. Uh, it, it, just a little bit of angelology, I guess to say, as we go through this in our theology class. Demons and angels are the same class of creature, although there are different classifications inside the angels, but they're the same class of creature, demons and angels. It's just demons are those who have sinned and angels have not sinned. Now, angels can sin, but they choose not to. They're not like us who have a sinful nature. They're created without a sinful nature. So they could choose to sin like Satan did uh, or the ones that are in heaven. They can choose not to sin. That's why their angels, as you'll see later on in Revelation, are always like, hey, don't worship me. Please don't worship me. You know, because they don't want to get kicked out of heaven because they don't want to be puffed up with pride like Satan was. And so we've got this guy who's the king over these angel demons that come out from the bottomless pit. The angel of the bottomless pit, which is a demon, and his name is Abaddon or Apollyon. Now, this is very interesting. You will not find this name in anywhere else in the New Testament. Apollyon. You won't find this anywhere else. Also, Abaddon. Now, you'll find maybe the, uh, <laughs> now you'll find maybe the, the, the Hebrew word, but it's never with reference to a person or to a angelic being. Now, that's not, that's not actually something that's unheard of. It's not something that surprises me that we don't know his name. Why? Because the Bible doesn't focus on angels and demons. That's not supposed to be a big focus of what we're thinking about all the time. I know with the Catholics, they have a whole bunch of names. So like there's this angel, this angel. For all we know, those are actually demonic names, <laughs> you know, uh, for all we know. Uh, but there's all these different angel names that they have, the supposedly angels. Well, the Bible doesn't have those names. Why? Because the Bible doesn't focus on angels. It's not about angels. It's about God, the Holy Spirit, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and their uh, ministry to us to save us eternally from our sins. Now, sometimes angels are used, but rarely do we know their names. We only know of Michael and Gabriel. That's pretty much it. Uh, demons, we don't know really of any demons except for Satan. That's it. We don't know of any other demonic names. And that's okay. I don't really care to know the name of any demons. I'm not you know, making a list of demonic names, you know? It's not something I really want to memorize, you know? Now, there is one that we know of, Apollyon. That's the one name that you'll find in the demons, uh, of the demons, in, in, except for Satan. Satan and Apollyon. Who is this guy? I don't know. Some kind of king demon of these imprisoned demonic forces. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's fascinating, it's interesting, because there's a Greek god, Apollo. You ever heard that, familiar with that? And I wonder, in fact, I, I was looking up a couple of Bible dictionaries, seeing if there's anything in you know, early Christian literature about this or anything like that. But the Greeks had a god, Apollo. And I was thinking about that. Isn't that fascinating? We often think of idolatry and false gods as just nothing. But the Bible doesn't say that idols and false gods are nothing. The Bible says that idols often represent demonic beings. And in the case of Apollo, hmm, seems like it maybe represents an actual demonic being who is the destroyer. And Apollo, the, the root word, de destruction, destroying, uh, and that's also the, uh, the Greek god Apollo was the god of destruction, as well as a bunch of other things as well. They kind of had him for a lot of different things, but Apollo. Isn't it ironic that the people of the earth who worship these false gods, one day they will meet them and realize, oh, uh, it's actually a real being and it's not someone who's my friend. These demons, these idols that people worship. And I, I think about this around the world. So many idols that are worshipped. I don't know if any of you guys have been over to uh, like India or Thailand. And it, it, uh, me, and, me and Pastor Martin, we're travel buddies. You know, we went to Thailand. Uh, but if you go to India, to Thailand, so many gods. Uh, in fact, actually I met someone here in Cebu, a Hindu. And I went to a Sikh temple because I was doing a research paper on Sikhism. It's another religion. And uh, I met this Hindu there, and he was telling me all about his favorite god, some elephant god with a bunch of arms and his foot on somebody's head. And I was like, really creepy. You know, I'm like, you like this guy? You know? <laughs> you know, our god, Jesus, died on the cross because he loved us so much. Their god is like, 
you know, like this with his head on somebody's, his foot on somebody's head. I'm like, you think that's going to be a nice guy? You know, like if you were to meet that guy, would he be your friend? You know? <laughs> uh, it, it was interesting. We had a really great conversation until, because uh, he thinks that all, uh, all gods are incarnations of Shiva, their main god. All gods, including Jesus. And so he was really mad when I brought up to him the Bible where it says, Jesus said that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. He was very mad. Then he got, he got very hostile towards me. I'm like, well, bro, chill, you know. <laughs> but but he, uh, he got very angry. Uh, but they're gods. I don't think that they're nothing. I think they represent demons. Not, you know, gods in the sense of the one true God who created the heavens and the earth. All angels or demons are created beings and the demons fell into sin but they are definitely of a higher power and outside our our level of authority and power and so to most humans especially ancient humans they would be seen to be as gods or maybe even aliens you know <laughs> today there's a lot of talk about aliens or well, maybe they're just demons and so this guy is a real guy apollo is a real guy some people worship him, maybe even still to this day, someday they're going to meet him and realize they picked the wrong guy to worship because this guy is not their friend. He's in fact the guy who wants to torment them with his demonic army of horse, locust, scorpion dudes with long hair <laughs> and, and, and jagged teeth. And so someday they're going to find out that they chose the wrong person to worship. Uh, and unfortunately, though, at this time, they're not even going to repent. They're going to realize that all their false religion is they're worshiping demons who are now torturing them, and yet they're still not going to repent and turn back to the Lord. Now in verse 12, we have the final warning, or as part of the warning of this seal, uh, sorry, this trumpet, not seal, uh, but then it's a warning of the coming uh, judgments. So in verse 12, it says, One woe is past, behold, Still two more woes are coming after these things. As if this wasn't bad enough. There's two more super judgments coming. The seals were bad. The early trumpets were bad. But nothing compared to these. Compared to the pain and suffering that these bring. One woe is past. Watch out. Two more are coming. It's even worse than these. And, you know, you'd hope that the people would repent. But unfortunately... They don't. And so as we close out today, uh, just remember what God is bringing the world to. You know, that, that can have so many different applications in our life. When you think about what the Lord is bringing in this world, he's going to take us out of it. He's going to destroy the earth. What manner of persons ought we to be living in this present time, knowing that this is the future of the world? We won't be here. We will be taken, but the rest of the world will be here. They need to know the gospel so that they can have the opportunity to be saved. Also, what should the focus of our lives be? As we live for him, whatever God calls us to, as we live for him, we should have a focus on serving him through our life because nothing in this world will survive and we don't certainly want to be here forever knowing that this is what's going to happen. So what manner of persons ought we to be in the present time? What should we live for?